Wednesday, May 17th, 1995. An army veteran, down on his luck and at odds with the world, entered a San Diego National Guard armory, stealing a 100,000 pound patent tank, taking the city of San Diego hostage during a televised rampage. And after desperately running out of options, authorities requested the assistance from the United States Marine Corps, requesting a Cobra attack helicopter to respond and take out the tank. But not before a Marine turned police officer seized the moment, bringing a nine mil to a tank fight. For 23 hellish minutes, San Diego was on lockdown. In 1995, San Diego was arguably in its prime. The economy was booming, the Padres were decent, and while the city was considered family friendly, crime in San Diego peaked in the mid 90s. And with a population of 2.6 million, the San Diego Police Department were severely overwhelmed. From gang violence, to homicides, to petty shit like, oh my God, it's too sunny, not sunny enough. But with that volume of crime came an increased level of training and experience. The San Diego Police Department was a highly capable force ready for anything, except a, a tank. However, San Diego was and still is a military town, and a lot of the members of the San Diego Police Department were military veterans who decided to settle down in the area after serving, many of whom understood armored warfare. But few understood it like Sean Nelson, a Utah man who would later relocate with his family to San Diego. And after high school, Nelson enlisted in the U.S. Army, where he attended armor school at Fort Knox, Kentucky, where he learned and mastered his craft as an armor crewman in 1978. And after completing his training, Nelson was deployed to West Germany with his tank battalion. He would get out of the army only two years later. But while serving, Nelson received multiple disciplinary actions, but nonetheless was honorably discharged in 1980. He returned to San Diego in pursuit of the American dream. He started his own plumbing business, married a woman with an equally successful career, and together they had it made. Nelson was quickly building a respectable reputation as a friendly plumber, and was famously known within his community as the plumber with the work van bearing personalized plates can fix. He took thousands of jobs, always quoted fair prices, and business was good. But the seemingly happy family man would soon descend through a chapter of misfortune in 1988, beginning with the passing of his mother. Overwhelmed with grief, Nelson became extremely erratic, so erratic that his wife hopelessly filed for divorce in 1990, causing Nelson to become even more erratic. And to make matters worse, shortly after his divorce, a motorcycle accident would leave Nelson with serious spinal injuries and a lifetime of chronic pain. And this erratic behavior was only worsened. While being treated at Sharp Memorial Hospital, Nelson tried to walk out and was physically stopped by hospital security. And after being discharged, Nelson would file a lawsuit for $1.6 million in damages, citing negligence, assault, battery, and false imprisonment at the hands of Sharp Memorial Hospital. A superior court judge would later dismiss the case, and the hospital countersued Nelson for $6,000, dealing Nelson yet another blow to his already declining well being. And to make matters even worse, his father's death would occur only two years later in 1992, causing his life to spiral out of control. And he turned heavily to drugs and alcohol. The feelings of hopelessness, desperation, coupled with a vague opinion that pain and misfortune predominate the world. The blue collar optimist became a pessimist. By 1995, Nelson would become a shell of his former self. After his tools were stolen, out of his work van, the tools required to perform his plumbing duties. And with no money and no tools to fulfill his jobs, Nelson was shit out of luck. His utilities were shut off, his mailbox began to overflow with collection letters, and his live-in girlfriend at the time moved out and left him. He was now facing reality as the bank began proceedings to foreclose his home. Addiction began taking over, and Nelson began seriously using hard drugs. During odd evening hours, Nelson would dig in his backyard, reportedly digging a hole as deep as 20 feet and telling his friends that he was mere inches from finding gold and possibly oil in his backyard. He began obsessing over his so-called mine shaft with delusions that finding these natural resources would be his financial salvation. Nelson took this mine shaft so seriously, he filed a notice informing the county of San Diego of his plans to mine his backyard. 
When city engineers rejected Nelson's plans, Nelson became manic, and through his suffering and his drug abuse, Nelson developed a nihilistic worldview, a dangerous combination for a man without a family. As during this time, while showing a neighbor his mine shaft, Nelson stated that Oklahoma was good stuff, in reference to the Oklahoma City bombing perpetrated by Timothy McVeigh, which occurred the month prior on April 19th of that year, an attack which left 168 people dead. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma. The neighbor was unsure if Nelson was condoning the attack or commenting on the drama the event caused over the last several weeks. But it's obvious Nelson took some form of inspiration. Whether it be in the shape of mass destruction or self-destruction, he devised his plan only one month following the Oklahoma bombing. He picked his location, a National Guard armory in the area of Kearney Mesa, in a time of 5 p.m the height of rush hour traffic. And on Wednesday, May 17th, in the seemingly utopian city of San Diego, Nelson drove his van to the National Guard Armory. Although the gate to the vehicle yard was typically locked after 5 p.m., employees at the armory were working late and left the gate wide open. Nelson drove straight in. Guardsmen stared at the van, bearing the license plate, can fix, and only assumed Nelson was supposed to be there as he looked the part of some sort of repairman until he climbed down the hatch of a 57-ton M60 patent tank and fired it up. I saw you singing in a photograph But I never learned your name Then it wasn't long I fell in love And hoped you'd feel the same So you told me, come on over Sing a sweet refrain And the world was turning slower I can explain With a top speed of 30 miles per hour Nelson's 100,000 pound tank plowed through dozens of unattended parked cars Even coming within feet of knocking down one resident's house And I always will do right by you he ran up over a cyclone fence about a foot from a house. It became evident to police through his technical maneuvering that whoever was operating the tank was a trained professional. And given the threat posed, and the inability to stop the threat, San Diego police notified the Marine Corps. Officials at Camp Pendleton suggested a Cobra attack helicopter, and the bird was prepped for takeoff. Nelson made his way northbound on Convoy Street before heading west onto Balboa Avenue. He entered the 805 freeway, heading southbound toward the 163 split. And while on the 805, he attempted to knock down a pedestrian bridge. And after multiple failed attempts, he eventually gave up. He made his way onto the 163 near the exit of Genesee when he made a sudden abrupt turn toward oncoming southbound traffic putting the lives of hundreds of innocent civilians in jeopardy. But while crushing through the center median, he disabled the left track and hung the body of the tank atop the rubble. Realizing how close he was to crushing oncoming vehicles, officers surrounded him and began scrambling with ideas on how to stop him. San Diego police officer Paul Paxton, a gunnery sergeant at the time with the Marine Corps Reserve, leaped onto the hull of the tank and opened the hatch. He called down to Nelson and ordered him to surrender. Nelson looked up, ignored Officer Paxton, and continued lurching the tank back and forth in an attempt to free. Three other officers rushed in to assist Officer Paxton, including this guy right here who looks like uh, Chunk 
from the Goonies. The officers ordered Nelson to surrender, but Nelson continued to ignore them and continued throttling the tank. Police were left with no other options as the risk of him freeing the tank and mowing down oncoming traffic was far too dangerous. Officer Paxton fired his weapon one time, striking Nelson in the shoulder. Nelson collapsed and officers rushed in to secure the scene. Nelson was ironically transported to Sharp Memorial Hospital, where he later succumbed to his wound. And on May 18th, at approximately 2.30 a.m., the tank was removed from the freeway. Miraculously, nobody else was hurt during this incident. The story shocked not only San Diego residents, but the nation alike. And debates soon followed as to whether or not police were justified in using lethal force. The question is, is there something else they could have done? One of the officers who ended up jumping on top of that tank to stop the chase, this cop operated a tank during Desert Storm. I know people look at it as a vehicle or a tank. That was a, that was a moving weapon. That was the biggest weapon on the loose from the city of San Diego yesterday. Why wouldn't they mace him? Why wouldn't they do anything? They shot the guy and left with no answer. There's one thing that goes unmentioned with this story. Given the facts and circumstances, his discontent for Sharp Memorial Hospital, and his history there as a patient. The fact that his tank stalled near Genesee on the 163 may not be a coincidence. From my experience working on an ambulance in San Diego a long time ago, Genesee is the 163 exit to Sharp Memorial. The hospital property is less than a few hundred yards from the exit, and his tank stalled fronting the hospital. It's not impossible to imagine that's where Sean Nelson was headed. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more of these mini documentaries in the works and you don't wanna miss them. So make sure you're subscribed. And also, if you might notice, I miss a Thursday here and there uploading a new video. It's only because I'm making a real documentary. I'm making two actually. I have a lot of stuff going on and there's a ton of exciting things happening behind the scenes, but I promise I'm gonna upload as consistently as possible. So thank you guys so much for your support and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching, goodbye. I saw you singing in a photograph But I never learned your name Then it wasn't long I fell in